Thank you, and thank you for joining us today for the Raleigh Transit Authority meeting today on October, Thursday, October 14th, starting here at 3.42 p.m. The governor has issued executive orders requiring individuals to remain in their homes except for certain activities, closing many businesses to the public and prohibiting any gatherings which do not comply with its terms. Because of the risk to the public that would arise from continued in-person meetings pursuant to NCGS, 166A-19.24, the city is converting Raleigh Transit Authority meetings to a remote electronic format for the duration of the state of the emergency. On our call roll, please signify by saying present. Uh, Nathan Spencer. Present. Karen Ringe. Lawrence Carter. Sarah Prado. Present. Jennifer Truman. Present. Ryan Burnett. Joshua Gill. Here, present. LaPonda Edmondson. Present. Jennifer Hoverstan. And do we have Councilman Branch, our city council liaison? All right, and I, Tulu Kaye, is present as well. Um, would anybody like to make a motion to approve the minutes from last week's meeting? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. This is Nathan Spencer, I'll second. All right, the motion has been moved and seconded. I will call the roll. Please signify your um, agreement or disagreement by saying aye or nay. Nathan Spencer. Aye. Sarah Prado. Aye. Jennifer Truman. Aye. Joshua Gill. Aye. LaPonda Edmonton. Aye. And I vote aye as well. So this has been moved and uh, the vote has been passed to approve the minutes from our September meeting. Are there any revisions or additions to the agenda for today? From staff or anyone? My apologies. Um, we, I, I'm not aware of any changes. I'll certainly let uh, staff correct me if I am wrong. I did want to bring up one thing, uh, Madam Chair. I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Prado stated that uh, she would have to uh, step away at 4.30. Um, so uh, we would just ask that uh, unless we're in, um, in to a presentation or something where that's not possible, uh, maybe she could just announce uh, when she leaves. Uh, that way we'll just have that for the record. Um, and you can acknowledge, acknowledge that as chair. Um, but again, unless uh, another staff member has anything to add, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, changes. Uh, we will have uh, some information on item E. Uh, it probably will not be the full report today, but we will have information for, uh, for item E. So there's not a change there. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Didn't you, uh, didn't you say there was something we may need to vote on the, the seating policy? Um, that that would certainly be up to the uh, to the board. Uh, we actually have brought that today as information out of committee, uh, the pedestal, pedestal seat policy. Um, just uh, so again, the board could act today, but certainly uh, can either refer that back to committee for further consideration, or um, or they can hold it to the next meeting so everybody has a a chance to mull that over. But would we would Sarah leaving an impact if we decided to vote on that? Yes. So should we move that to the front? Uh, we do have a uh, visitor today, so um, we might want. So I would think that either one is fine. That, that is completely up to you, Madam Chair. So yeah, I would make that either A or B. Yes. This is David Walker. I, I think even if Sarah leaves at this point, you would still have quorum if nobody else leaves. Okay. Well, let's get started. We have some, we have about 13 minutes before our, uh, public comments. So we can go ahead and start with item A for the update on the Capitol North Corridor plan. All right. 
Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is John Anagnost. I work in the planning and development department at the city of Raleigh. And so I was with you last in March of this year, sharing with you uh, what at that time was expected to be the final version of this quarter plan for presentation to the city council. We have made some changes here in, in the last stage uh, that I'll go over with you today. So next, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and I'll also note with us uh, today is uh, Mike Zaraski and Rachel Gaylord Miles from our consultant WSP. Uh, so in this presentation, I'll go into the background of the study just a little bit and then talk about what's in the contents of the final plan report for the capital north corridor plan. Next slide, please. So to remind you, this study deals with the portion of Capitol Boulevard between 440 and 540. Uh, so this map is turned on its side, so north is on the, on the right side. And it's it's mostly the area right along the corridor, and this is a transportation-oriented plan. Uh, it's really with the anticipation that the North Carolina Department of Transportation is likely to want to initiate a, a street improvement uh, project for Capitol Boulevard, which in this area is US Highway 1, and a portion of it is US 401. Uh, and NCDOT has a project to convert the area north of 540 to a freeway, and then a project for the I-440 interchange with Capitol Boulevard as well. So we think that they'll want to tie those together uh, in the next 10 years or so. Uh, so. Next slide, please. And so we started this in 2018, so we're now over three years into the process, though the later part of the pandemic has been uh, not very busy for, for planning. Uh, next slide. We'll see that we're in that final stage. Next slide, please. And so that did involve five stages of public engagement in the form of public meetings, and then a lot of engagement on the ground in the corridor. So pop up events at shopping centers, at the Triangle Town Center Mall, for example, uh, and then uh, meeting with community groups like the Millbrook CAC at the Health and Human, Wake County Health and Human Services and other groups like that. Next slide, please. And so from that, we developed vision themes to guide the actual recommendations of the plan. So at each stage of public engagement, as we were developing proposals and then reviewing those with the public, we were comparing them with these vision themes uh, of essentially improving overall regional traffic flow, but then also considering multimodal transportation within the corridor thinking about future development that is going to uh, support the proposals of, of bus rapid transit service in this quarter, which you'll see in a moment, and then improving the appearance and encouraging the community to be owners of the future design of the corridor. And next slide, please. And so the actual final plan report has these components, and I'll note that this community investments part, which you now see is the first bullet, had previously been uh, the third item here and was, was um, were considered a layer to go on top of the other two proposals to sort of provide the, the display of, of the vision of the community. But uh, in the past year, we really took a, a look at this plan and with the realization that the transportation proposals that are in this plan are significant and have the, the potential and, and high likelihood of disrupting existing businesses and, and residential communities here. And so we want to make sure that the city is investing in preparing those communities to, to join in the improvements in the investments and the growth of this area uh, rather than being displaced by it. And then so that and then there's that portion and then the other actual you know, physical proposals about transportation improvements. Next slide please. And so this is kind of what I just talked about. So we are proposing to convert Capitol Boulevard in this area to uh, what's called a multi-way boulevard, where there would it would be wider and there would be great separated interchanges. And those things take up space and they also make Capitol Boulevard, it, you know, to a certain extent, a little bit of a barrier to east-west travel. Uh, and so those kind of things can be disruptive like I said, to, to folks who are already living and working and running businesses here. And so on the next slide, we'll see some examples of ways that we want to respond to that proactively. So making investments in small businesses, in community development and organization prior to there being large scale transportation projects that disturb those existing communities. And those are things like small business incubators and alliances, um, and you know, neighborhood 
uh, organizing around the, the design of streetscapes that are going to come with those transportation proposals. And so one of the key things that we've added at this last phase is that those are now the front part of the plan. They come before the other proposals and there's clear information in the plan report that says the community investment should occur first before the transportation plans are implemented and before the land use policies call for additional urban development. Uh, that, that, that before those big changes happen, these investments need to occur. And then adding actual dollar figures and specific time frames for these community investments. So not just saying that there should be actions, but the, how much the city needs to be spending on those investments to make it clear uh, that that's not just a conceptual something to think about. It really is intended to, to be a concrete action item that needs to take place. And next slide, please. So once we have that, now you're probably curious, and some, I, mean, I think a lot of you have seen this before, but you know, why are we so concerned about the transportation proposals? And it's because the proposal is to convert Capitol Boulevard to a multi-lane boulevard in between 440 and 540. So that means a dedicated area in the center of the roadway for bus rapid transit, and then and an inner set of vehicle lanes that are for regional travel that would have essentially no traffic signals, uh, and then outer lanes that would have traffic signals and have access points to neighborhoods and shopping centers. Uh, next slide, please. And the way that those things all interact with each other is that the, the what are today signalized intersections, traffic signals, have to be converted to grade separated interchanges. And those, like I said, take up room that is gonna impact private property uh, but we did choose the most compact form of interchanges that we could, which is in many cases this tight diamond uh, or urban diamond style of interchange, which reduces the footprint and allows us to uh, encourage that the, the actual street corner between the local streets is as close as it is to the current grade so that when people are driving, the businesses are sort of in, this, in the same reference point that they're accustomed to, that they're not being elevated or dropped below where those small businesses are. Uh, next slide, please. And so you can see here, this is pretty much every signalized intersection is proposed to be an interchange. And then there are some that would actually lose a little bit of their access to Capitol Boulevard, uh, meaning you couldn't you couldn't make left turns. And those are Star Mount, uh, Old Buffalo, and Oak Forest. And so in those cases, it's either a right in, right out. Uh, so you could make right turns onto or off of Capitol, but not a left turn. And then at Old Buffalo, it's basically you can just cross Capitol Boulevard to the other side, um, but very limited access. And so, again, that's impactful to businesses. Next slide, please. And so this is expensive. We would need assistance from North Carolina Department of Transportation to achieve this. The earliest funding round this could possibly be entered into wouldn't uh, even assign the funding until 2026 or 2027. And then that means even at that point, so we have to go through a construction design and engineering process, which is likely to take multiple years and then finally right of way acquisition. So, you know, a, a projected start of construction of 2031 is probably a little bit optimistic considering NCDOT has a little bit of financial trouble right now. Uh, but we think that's actually helpful because that gives us that amount of time to work on those community investments that I talked about earlier that the more time we have for the city to make those investments and for them to actually start working, uh, the better off residents and business owners will be when the projects actually begin. Next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. And so this is uh, a little bit more information about how those interchanges can be beneficial to walking. Uh, so at today you have to cross six or eight lanes, depending on how many turn lanes there are, uh, of roadway on Capitol Boulevard in one signal cycle. And the medians tend to be very narrow. In the future, when there would be, would be an interchange, you would have shorter crosses. So you'd have to cross only half of that width at any one time uh, because you would have a waiting area on the interchange bridge in between the different directions of local lanes. And pedestrians would also avoid the regional lanes entirely because they would cross over or under them in the interchange. And uh, that interchange is also where the bus rapid transit stop would be located. And so that also facilitates access to the 
the transit service. Next slide, please. Here's a little you know, more detailed look about how that could actually be applied on an existing intersection in Capitol Boulevard, this Buffalo Road and New Hope Church Road. Again, really trying to have the most compact form of interchange that we can. Next slide, please. And this is how the bus rapid transit station could be integrated. And so one of the big advantages is that this reduces the incentive to cross Capitol Boulevard away from a street corner because if the bus, if the bus stop is at the intersection, there's not a good reason to cross in the middle of the block. Next slide, please. And so then at each of, we have four proposed BRT stations. Of course, those are conceptual, any future BRT planning process. If that occurs, which there is not a, currently a BRT plan in the Lake County Transit plan for this section of Capitol Boulevard, uh, that those station locations will be revisited, but we have a starting point for recommending them. And so these are the four locations. And then around them, we have land use policies that would talk about having more urban character, a mix of uses, uh, and things like that. Next slide, please. And one thing to note is that the, the land use policies that will be applied in those areas, again, would be delayed until the community investments are made. Uh, so not encouraging taller development, not encouraging redevelopment until the, the city has spent the money assisting local businesses. Next slide, please. And here you can see an example at Many City. And another big feature there is, is proposing additional public streets to take the place of driveways within parking lots that exist today. So public streets uh, provide sidewalks and then because of the uh, bicycle street section that's recently been approved by the city council, uh, in many cases would also include a protected bicycle facility. So really, a big goal is that not just having the bus rapid transit at each of these locations, but having a connected network with smaller blocks with proper pedestrian and bicycle facilities. So no matter where someone is coming from to get to the bus service, they have a safe and convenient way to get there. And that actually getting to the bus stop, of navigating the area around Capitol Boulevard itself, again, safe and convenient. Next slide, please. And uh, like I said, those proposed streets would be constructed through uh, redevelopment of private property. So that is likely to take some time for those all to come into to place. Uh, but it's an important part of this process as well. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, those land use recommendations would be delayed until community investments happen. Next slide, please. Bicycle facilities are also prioritized. And so the, the bicycle aspect of the plan, and really a lot of it is based on the existing bike rally plan. There are a couple of new proposed facilities, but a lot of it is just saying, here's the sequence, here's the, the most important one, bicycle facilities that we want to construct first, that will have the greatest value in connecting uh, neighborhoods with the bus service. Next slide, please. And so that's the summary of the, the plan. Uh, and so we have Ask a planner session scheduled for October 21st and 23rd. Postcards for that are out this week. And then we have planning commission starting their review on November the 18th. Uh, so that's my presentation. Um, I believe when, I, when we were here before, what, what we heard was that it still feels like Capitol Boulevard is going to be kind of a barrier or a divider for the communities on either side. Um, and that, I mean, that is sort of an unavoidable fact of the, just the nature of it being a highway and moving at this point 70,000 cars a day and projected in the future to be closer to 100,000 cars a day. Um, and so I think what we're, we really want to accomplish here is acknowledging that that is still can exist as that form of facility as a highway essentially, but that the city can, can do a lot to push NCDRT to provide really good quality pedestrian facilities, and then just for the city to do our own part to provide the supporting infrastructure in the surrounding area. So that aside from the most highway-esque part of Capitol Boulevard, every other aspect of it we can make as, as urban and walkable as possible. And so that's the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the authority? Uh, 
This is Jen Truman. I had a question. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciated that you guys included a sample image of what BRT could look like integrated in the plan. Um, and I know that we don't currently um, per se have defined station locations, but I'm wondering if um, like you have the sample rendering of what an interchange would look like um, as far as um, tra travel lanes for vehicles, but it doesn't look like all of the pedestrian crossings and BRT crossings are in that sample rendering. Will that be in place in the final report? Because I think as a document that lives forward, you know, 10 or 15 years into the future, that could be really important. Yes, so the the rendering that I showed of the Buffalo Road and New Hope Church Road intersection, that includes the, it did include the bus traffic transit lanes. And then you might've noticed that there was sort of a buffer area between those lanes and the regional travel lanes. And that buffer area is intended to be wide enough uh, to accommodate the actual station platform for BRT. And then of course there would have to be uh, escalators or elevators providing ADA accessible access between there and the either upper or lower level where the, the uh, local street connects with the interchange. Um, and then in terms of the bicycle and pedestrian approaches to the interchanges, yes, we do have those. Uh, we had a sub consultant tool design draw up three different variations based on the size of the cross street. So whether, it, you know, it's a two lane or a four lane avenue uh, and, you know, whether it's a um, multi-use path or a protected bicycle facility on the cross street. So basically indicating how would that transition into the interchange? How would it pass through the interchange? And so we have those as an appendix to the plan report and that will be part of the review documents uh, as this goes to planning commission and city council. And the key thing about that is once that's part of an adopted plan, and aside from the fact that the city already has a policy that says a grade separate interchange has to be constructed with protected bicycle facilities, we having those concept drawings is also a trigger for North Carolina Department of Transportation because they have a fairly new policy that says they will provide more funding for locally approved bicycle and pedestrian facilities associated with the transportation project. And so by having those that gives us the leverage when they initiate that project to say, this is the style of facility that we want. Uh, and so, you know, let's, let's make sure that's included. Thanks for that. Yeah, including those, especially as images, I think is critical in these plans because, you know, a picture speaks a thousand words, um, especially to folks that don't read uh, traffic plans all the time. And then I, I think the other critical piece of that is that, um, the BRT will only function if it's easy to get off the cross town loops and onto it. And so when, as from a trans perspective, as we look at these plans in the future, um, how someone gets off a bus that's going on, say, Millbrook Road and across um, at Mini City and efficiently gets onto the BRT as just as important. And the, the great separations, you know, there are ways to do that. I'm thinking like in Alexandria, their train and uh, to BRT transitions, but it's really important to think about those cross connections, um, not just pedestrians that are leaving those things uh, that are nearby, but also people that are coming across from other buses and making those transfers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've definitely tried to think about that in terms of the location selection for the, for the conceptual BRT locations. That's why you saw the, the one located at Millbrook because that is a, a cross down connector uh, link. And then we are also uh, indicating that at Triangle Town Center, that and this is aligns with other weight transit planning uh, and go rally planning that there would be a transfer station uh, at Triangle Town Center and then that could then serve folks coming in either for a parking ride if they're driving or for uh, the the uh, Wake Community College uh, connector bus that goes farther north. So yeah, we, we, that certainly is a priority. Uh, it is difficult to have that level of detail because this is so conceptual before we get to an actual NCBRT project, but yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, I have a question. So yeah. in some of the timing or some of the, the negative impact, you, you pointed out that it could impact, you know, low income households and small businesses. One question, do you have an idea of how many low income households and small businesses is possibly could be impacted? Well, we know that there's 
uh, at least 200 small and local businesses on this corridor between 440 and 540. Um, some of those are more destination businesses where their customers know about them and will have some protection in the sense that the customers will still, you know, if a customer has a regular barber shop that they go to, uh, they'll probably still find a way to go there, even if there's some uh, transportation project that's making a you know, part, portion of the street closed for some time. Um, but yeah, so, so we do have a sense of how many businesses in terms of households, that is really highly dependent on private development. And I think that's really the, the aspect of disruption that we're thinking of for resident, from the residential perspective is if developers see this bus rapid transit and the, and the roadway improvements as a signal of, oh, this is the next, uh, you know, development area of Raleigh where we can come in and build taller buildings, then what, you know, a lot of times the, the places developers like to look is existing apartment developments because they're large pieces of land with a single owner. And so that's where delaying the land use policy saying we're not going to say that this apartment site should should be redeveloped as a much taller building. Not adding that type of policy guidance until further down the road, uh, we think will help sort of delay that that motivation for, for developers to say, oh, this is the next part of the area. Um, so that's, do, that's kind of have, the way of thinking about it. Do you have an idea of how many households in that area are low to moderate income? Um, I could look it up. I know we have done that demographic research. I can tell you there's about a population of around 20,000 people in the census tracts that are associated with uh, this quarter. Um, and I think it's above 30% of households are low income. So just, you know, based on that, you know, it's gotta be above 5,000 households, or excuse me, above 5,000 people, which is about 2,500 to 3,000 households. And in some of it is asking for, you know, supporting different policies, things like that, but even creating community investment and community development grants. Are we suggesting, can we suggest that those, that that becomes a budget item in the weight transit plan if a part of us creating this transit plan is going to possibly displace people or disrupt businesses? Hmm. Um, I don't think that that is completely out of the question. I think this isn't, this isn't a transit plan um, specifically, you know, we are including a recommendation for bus rapid transit, but really the, it's the Wake County transit plan that we mm -hmm. would formally be doing that of actually programming that service. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think if, if that's part of those conversations, but there's no objection uh, right. to that, but I think the city is probably more likely to be the agency that takes the lead on that through the city's budget, annual budget. So the, the BRT is in the weight transit plan, correct? It stops at Crabtree Boulevard currently. There, and you're gonna actually hear at today's meeting, I saw there, there was an item for Mila to talk about the major investment study for the for the extension, potential extension beyond Crabtree Boulevard for the Northern Route. And so that is something that we wanna make sure is coordinated with this plan is, you know, whether that's on Capitol Boulevard or Six Forks or both, uh, that this plan is able to react to that service. But currently, the way it's plan, Northern Route stops at Crabtree Boulevard inside 440. Okay. But if we understand that our plans are, I mean, you said it's not outside the realms. So I'm just saying if we understand that mm -hmm. the plans that we're putting in place could negatively impact small businesses and households, and you've come up with some suggestions around that, then if we are responsible for it, then maybe we should help fund some of those solutions. I think that's a great partnership idea and certainly something that I would be interested in uh, having be a continuing conversation as, as we look at the implementation of these, these action items, certainly. Okay. Madam Chair, this is Nathan Spencer. Uh, may I ask a question as well? Yes. Sorry, I uh, my connection fell out for a moment, so I apologize if I asked a question that was already asked. Um, John, how, um, 
How many people are projected to come into this corridor to live and work in the next um, uh, next decade or so? Um, and with that uh, same question, um, how will that affect, you know, if, if we don't do this and we don't do increased housing along this route as well, um, how will that affect the, um, the corridor? Yeah. Um, so the number of people that can move in is highly dependent on private development that the city, you know, we can have policies that say you're allowed to have that amount of development. We cannot force any private property owners to do that development. Um, but we do expect that there is going to be demand, particularly with bus rapid transit. And so I, I think our market study projected in terms of residential growth, uh, somewhere in the range of, of 50 to 100% increase for this quarter over the 25 year time horizon. Um, and so that is, that's kind of where we were, what we were thinking of in terms of the land use policy, which again would be delayed for a few years. Um, and so, but you know, it's, it's a tension that's always gonna exist between local planning and NCDOT planning, where as they continue to expand the highways, Right, they're converting uh, US 1 north of 540 to a freeway. Well, that suddenly makes land in you know, Franklin County, Lewisburg, Wake Forest more attractive because suddenly it's, it's quicker to get to the job centers uh, along 540 or towards downtown Raleigh or Newtown. And so, you know, I think and we can't stop NCDOT from expanding those roadways and we can't tell those other, those other jurisdictions not to plan for additional housing in their jurisdictions. But what we can do is say, Raleigh will have capacity. And so if people are looking at that choice and saying, well, I'd rather live in a, a more urban style of development and have access to bus rapid transit, we wanna have that option be available. Uh, and not just for people who are moving in, but for everyone, the people who already live here. Uh, you know, so that's kind of the thought process. It's really, as the name of the plan says, the subtitle is, a future of choice. And that's really what it is, is having a choice, what transportation mode, what type of housing, uh, that, that's really what it's about. Just to follow up on that, uh, does that mean that we also have the opportunity if we, um, uh, if we do do bus rapid transit along the route that uh, it has the opportunity to possibly uh, alleviate some of the high costs uh, the rising cost and displacement, because what could happen is that people who uh, would otherwise move into the corridor now have a faster route by living in Franklinton or something like that than they would have had um, if it didn't exist and they had to commute all the way from out there. Yeah, I mean, there will be some amount of self-selection where people will say my preferred living style is, is a single family lot. In a, in a more suburban context, certainly. Um, but, you know, like I said, we are expecting there to be additional demand for the style of urban living associated with high quality transit. Uh, and so, we, you know, we, we still wanna be as fully prepared for that. And, and again, if there's that other tension of wanting to have the additional housing, but not wanting it to be so quick and such a rapid transition that people who are already living here don't have the opportunity to to find a, if you know if their housing situation becomes unstable, that there's that there's a, a gradual transition to give them the opportunity to say, I want to stay here. Are there other options for me? Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you for taking time to give us that presentation. Thank you, John. All right, it looks like we are at 417. I know that we do have one public comment caller, uh, Mr. Dwight Spencer. So I want us to go ahead and pause now to uh, jump into public comments. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, how are you, Dwight? I'm doing good. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for asking, and to all the Transit Authority members, just very briefly and short, and I'm, I still have 
Um, I do want to inform you, I did send out emails this morning to most of the um, Transit Authority members, um, and just to inform you for information, um, including Mr. David E., the Assistant Director. Um, the North Carolina Transit Workers Association will be hosting the first ever Raleigh Transit Workers um, Town Hall meeting on this Saturday, October the 16th at New Bethel Christian Church. And as most of you have seen the emails um, of our special guests, uh, city council members, uh, Wake County Commissioner, um, Wake County uh, Transit Advisory Committee, as well as NCAA board members. And we have invited the uh, bus operators and behind the city transit workers. And thank you all for um, listening to them. And we clearly understand that there are issues and concerns that you all cannot resolve or cannot touch, but you have addressed a lot of those issues and concerns of these operators. And um, so this will be an opportunity for them to come to this meeting on Saturday and voice their issues and concerns before the transit um, decision makers. And we hope that this will have an impact on the way our transit system will be managed going towards the future of our um, transit system. Um, so I hope that most of you or some of you can make it. It's going to be a very important meeting to them, as we have stressed to them it's going to be a very important meeting to them, and um, most of the elected officials are glad that this meeting is taking place to give them a better idea, because uh, they're hearing it from the horse's mouth. Um, you know, they heard it from us, a few bus operators, so um, we hope that um, they come out, and we hope that they appreciate what the NCTAA has, do, has done. And this is just solely purpose uh, for information for them. Uh, but they have some valid issues and concerns that they want to address as, you know, not only about the transit management firm that they work for, but also the city of Raleigh Transit. Uh, we have invited retired bus operators and other bus operators and transit workers that left for whatever reason. Um, we have a, a few of them going to be there as well. So I hope that um, we will give you all a full update written report on how this meeting went and, um, uh, uh, the mayor will be on the uh, call. She's having a surgical procedure, so we're going to bring that in by phone call. Um, so we hope that this will have an impact on their decision as well as the city manager. And I do want to say one last thing, uh, 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 Mr. David Eaton, uh, especially um, and Transit Authority member, we will advocate this to Rollins City Council and the city manager. If Transdev, if they have already not gotten a six-month extension on their contract, however, way that's going now, we will be um, advocating and propose that they they don't have. Uh, it's, we're going to propose that they only get a three month, ninety days extension on their contract. I know six months is the most that they can go. The city will allow them to go. I'm not wrong, but we're going to um, propose that they only have a three month extension on their contract. We don't want train. We don't need to keep playing games with transfer. Um, everybody knows what's going on with this company. So we're going to continue to advocate to council and city manager that they do break ties with Transdev. I did have an opportunity to talk with the attorney, um, Tanzer, I believe that's her name. Um, we did hold conversation, um, um, and I just expressed my concerns to her, and she expressed her concerns to me as well. So uh, we are thankful for that, and we hope that we continue to move in a positive direction with the city of Raleigh Transit, and we're going to do whatever we can to help Raleigh Transit move forward in the direction that y'all chose for it to go in. And I just want to say thank you, Madam Chair, and to every Transit Authority member for your listening ear to the bus operators who came before you, as well as our association. We thank you, we appreciate you, and we will uh, be supporting you all. That's all I got to say today. Thank you, Dwight, and thank you for calling in. We did, I do want to just give a quick update that uh, me and Nathan did have a chance to meet with uh, Corey and some other people from uh, Go Raleigh staff. David was also there to bring some of these issues to the forefront and ask and try to find ways that they could be resolved um, through city council or with the city. Um, there are some where we are waiting to get some feedback on some of the different measures that we can that can be taken from the meeting. I don't know if you have any updates on that, David. Uh, we are actively uh, gathering that information. Uh, we should have that. Um, we certainly want to get that to uh, uh, to the council or our liaison, Mr. Branch, as well. Uh, but hopefully, we'll certainly have that by next month. 
Um, some of the things that we were discussing was definitely uh, leaning towards making sure that we take care of the mental health aspect of what's going on with some of the operators um, and some of the transit employees uh, and see if they can get some of the same support that the police officers currently have. Uh, we were also looking at other ways that there can maybe be bonus bonuses, excuse me, levied or funds used to help supplement some of the, the ridership. I know that, I mean, some of, some of the employees, I know that uh, our operator shortage is something that's going around everywhere and that is causing a stressor on certain other operators, but we are still trying to ha be, have an opening ear uh, to figure out what other solutions um, some of the employees or operators feel like are accessible. So if you can pass that along to us and we can definitely shoot that over to the group and maybe reschedule another meeting to add some of the other solutions that you all are coming with, uh, which I think would be really, really helpful from the people actually experiencing the issue. Um, Nathan, did you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think that uh, well sums it up. We, it was a good meeting. I thought that uh, the counselor was receptive and um, that uh, staff was uh, willing to listen and research things and come back to us. So Dwight, are you still there? Um, I want to say, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to say thank you. And I appreciate David uh, meeting with y'all and the other who met. And I hope that we can soon bring all of this to a resolution that the bus operators and transit workers can be satisfied and under under a new and good management, someone that will reach out and listen to that issue and concern because it, it, they are important to the citizens of Raleigh and Wake County. And that's one of the reasons um, we chose to invite county commissioners to this meeting as well, because I know that, you know, they are partnering with y'all on some transit stuff, even though they don't have their own transit, but, um, you know, we do serve Wake County citizens. And so, we want all this to come to an end very soon um, so we can stop talking about this and just start talking about the positive things and the positive move that Raleigh Transit can move toward. Because right now, um, Transdev is giving a bad look on our transit, and we just need to move forward. And these bus operators need to have some type of relief now. I mean, they really do. And um, the, these elected officials and others who are going to be there Saturday, they're going to be in for a surprise because they're going to hear some stuff that y'all have not heard. And um, because I don't think they're going to hold back. And um, so I think it's time that we move forward. And I hope that's the, um, the, 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 uh, the objective of all of this. So, again, I just want to say thank you all for all that you have done. Um, as authority members, I think we have one of the best transit authorities in the whole state. Um, you have listened and, and the bus operator. And I always let them know that they have the full support of the authority as well as the um, council and the community at large because, they are the ambassadors of uh, our transit. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, uh, Vice Chair, and all the members once again for your um, support. Thank you, Dwight. And thank you, um, Mr. David Eaton. I know David was surprised by that. Thank you, <laughs> Dwight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Always. All right. Thank, thank y'all. Y'all have a great meeting and have a great safe day, too. Dwight, if you have a second, as you all head into your meeting on Saturday, um, I know that the, the point is definitely to bring awareness to some of the issues going on, to all of the issues going on, but also have prepared some list of solutions from the operator that also go ahead and directly communicate. And if you have that, please pass it to us also so that we can pass it out. I know that you, you all have given us reports, but I mean specific outside of TransDev solutions that when we, when we talk about mental health and things like that from the operators that we can then re-communicate and it, that can be the sheet of music that we're all singing off of to try to get this resolved versus you all uh, feeling like you need to do it yourself, if that makes sense. Okay, I will do that. We will make sure that we ask them to come up with some resolution on Saturday as well. Thank you. Thank you, and y'all have a great meeting and a great day, okay? All right, have a great one. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you. All right, I know that we have another information item restarting the authority meeting at 4.27 p.m. The next information item on our agenda is the Wake BRT North Major Investment Study, RFQ. 
Sorry, Madam Chair, this is Sarah Prado. I think I'm just going to take the chance right now before we move on to something else to um, step out. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Have a great day. All right. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yes, oh, I can. Thank you. All right. Uh, my name is Megan Finnegan, and I am a transit planner with the BRT team. Today, I will be presenting an update on the Northern Corridor, uh, specifically the current status of the major investment study. So to provide an overview of the Wake BRT program, uh, Newburn Avenue is the most advanced. It's currently in the final design stage. Both Western and Southern Corridor are in the preliminary design phase, and Northern Corridor is prepping to begin its major investment study. So we are in the planning phase. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to recap, uh, we presented an update on the Northern Corridor to RTA Route Committee back in June. Um, and today we are providing a summary of the consultant selection process for the study. Next slide. Thank you. So just to provide some background, um, the Northern Corridor is one of the four corridors that was identified back in 2016 in the first week transit plan. In 2018, there was further work uh, done through the Wake Transit Plan Major Investment Study, which identified two alternatives for the corridor. So those two alternatives connected downtown Raleigh to Crabtree Boulevard, right near the Greyhound bus station. Uh, and then most recently, the Wake Transit Plan update called for the extension of BRT infrastructure including an extension to Triangle Town Center and North Hills. Next slide. So because of the updated Wake Transit Plan and new considerations, including the growth uh, in Northern Raleigh, a further study was needed to better define the Northern Corridor project. So as a result, we have the Northern Corridor Major Investment Study. Uh, the purpose of the study is to develop recommendations to connect to North Hills and Triangle Town Center. So the MIS study will take approximately 12 to 18 months, so roughly a year and a half. Next slide. Thank you. So a request for qualifications was issued in June, meaning we published a request for consultant teams to submit proposals for this study. So we received four submittals and following scoring with the selection committee, uh, we interviewed the top two ranked consultant teams. After interviews, HDR was recommended as the top ranked consultant. Next slide. Oh, thank you. So HDR has experience with both transit planning and BRT design, and they have proposed a 20% DBE participation goal, which exceeds the city's current established goal or DBE goal of 13%. So our next steps for the study uh, is to develop the full scope of work and fee and pending city council authorization, we'll kick the study off in early 2022. And I think that was my last slide. Any Thank questions? Thank you for your presentation, Megan. Um, are there any questions from the authority? Madam Chair, um, just as a question, uh, Megan, who is the contact going to be from HDR? Uh, Jorge Luna is, is the project manager. I apologize, I missed her. I didn't hear that. No, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm talking quietly as well. Um, Jorge Luna is the project manager. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right, there's no other questions, thank you. One more. Thank you. A pedestrian seat policy. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Matt Van Hook, transit planner with the city of Raleigh. Um, so now, after some of our largest capital projects, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, maybe our smallest capital project. Um, but um, as we all know, a seat can make a big difference. Um, but uh, first, I'll go through the pilot of use of our pedestal seats, and then we can continue our discussion about um, some of the suggested language for revising our policy. So we have had 
Um, we did receive some pedestal seats from two companies, Jericho Palm and Semi Seat. Um, our first priority with installing those seats was at RHA and DHIC um, housing. And so we installed our first unit at Levister Fort at Fayetteville, um, which is in the Walnut Terrace neighborhood. Um, and that was uh, shown on, on the first slide. Um, and we have six installations coming up. Um, the first three are at um, RHA and DHIC properties. Um, the next two are located at bus stops. Um, we're, we're doing a bench replacement. Um, and then the final one on State Street is a new placement. Next slide, please. And um, so the pilot project, we have about seven seats remaining. And so we have to identify uh, five additional bus stops. And at one of those bus stops, we'll be doing a side-by-side -side placement. Um, and then we'll be working on a survey. We're working with marketing right now um, uh, to have uh, a survey that we'll place at each of these sites. Um, and that survey will really get at what people's um, thoughts about the seating option are and also get some preferences uh, between the two models. And just to highlight some of the photos at the bottom, um, so that center one is the unit that was given by Jericho Palm. And, and the one on the left is uh, the next iteration from, from Jericho Palm that um, they, the holes should dissipate some of the heating issue and allow the water to drain better. And then the image on the right is um, a photo from the company semi -C. Um That's a stock photo, but um, our unit um, will look similar, but in, in the red color, um, and it will also have the offset uh, offset base, but not include the handrail. Um, and so that's the recap of the pilot. Um, are there any questions um, at this point about what we're doing with the semi seats? Um, next, I'll get into the policy. So I'll just pause there if there's any any questions. Madam Chair, I've got a question, um, Matt. Did you say that your uh, the staff is replacing benches? My understanding was that this wasn't; these weren't going to take the place of benches. These were going to go in places where there was nothing. Um, so, so those two sites would occur um, in Dixie Trail. Um, those were sites that had benches damaged by vehicles, um, and so there weren't benches there at the time, um, but they were suitable suitable locations um, with the right sidewalk width and within city right of way. Um, and so we we had just identified them as um, two good places uh, to place a bench because we had also received some requests from the public for those. I have a question. So I know that we've been talking about Pool Road and MLK and up rock quarry and things like that where there are no seats and there's no seats at bus stops why aren't we looking at some of those locations um we we can definitely look at those and we're open to some other suggestions um we obviously want to uh take a, a systematic approach um with the policy um but we do have those those five units for the pilot um that we're open to suggestions um, just as long as we can meet that um, city right of way and um, five foot sidewalk to keep the clear path. Like you said, I'm okay. I had a question in the chat about whether or not the seats were big enough for an average adult. How much weight can the seats hold? That's a good question. Like both of those questions. Um, the weight, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but uh, some of the some of that is uh, will include in in the survey. Um, you know, if people think the amount of seating is adequate. No, I mean for these pedestals, like what's the what's the if we put them out there and somebody sits on it and breaks it, like what's the strength of the what's the schematics of the stool of the pedestal? Yeah, Jen, this is uh, David. I mean, Jen, uh, we do have the spec sheets on them. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking that uh, Mr. Walker might be able to chime in, but 
Uh, I mean, they're well over, I think, 200 pounds for each side um, uh, would be, you know, the seated capacity uh, for weight. Um, it, there are general specifications for uh, concrete depth as well as the type of lags that you use. Uh, so we make we have to make sure that we follow those instructions. Uh, but certainly they're um, uh, that's what you know, that's what they're designed for. Uh, they do use these in Durham and other locations, and I'm not aware of any issues that they've had as long as they followed uh, manufacturer recommendations. Yeah, I, and I would emphasize too that um, yeah, these these products are used um, in other cities. Um, it's just new new for Raleigh, so they have been um, engineered over time. Uh, but any other questions before we move on to the policy? Um, this is LaPond. I did have a quick yep. question. In terms of the um, pedestal seats here, uh, I guess, will the survey also ask questions about, I see that the, the rain would be able to kind of come through some of these holes, but I'm also imagining about like the temperature and how hot these seats may get. Um, and then also, given that they are so close together, um, you know, people's preference for having to sit with a stranger so closely, um, I'm, I'm curious about what people's reactions to that might be. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we can certainly make sure that we have questions about that um, on, on the survey. And then, and I, and I'm, I'm sorry, Matthew. Oh, and I was just going to add, you know, just regarding the proximity, sometimes the, the handrail um, can potentially help with that delineating space as well. So I will remind the, the board that um, obviously this is the, we certainly have our shelter policy, 10 boardings or, you know, or more a day. So we're putting actual bus shelters with benches and everywhere we have 10 boardings or more a day. Um, we have this lower than 10. Uh, where we have the opportunity to put either benches and the and the semi seats when a standard bench might be a six foot bench that you would see similar to a back bench, but we don't put backs on our benches. We just use a regular wrought iron bench as if it's not a semi seat. Uh, the semi seats, the reason we defaulted to these is because these we can actually install uh, an existing five foot sidewalk widths. Um, and not build additional infrastructure around them. We still have to do a site plan if it's an NCDOT right of way, uh, but we don't have to do a full site plan and get easements uh, for additional concrete and other infrastructure as these can be placed in those tight locations. So remember that these are do have a specific role and that they're filling in in locations where we can't put a where we can't put a shelter. It's not warranted where we can't put a bench because it. We don't have the right of way width or the sidewalk width to meet ADA standards, but we can put a pedestal seat. So if we can't meet those first two shelter regular bench, then we default to a semi seat. So um, those are the kind of trade offs that we're looking for here is as we start thinking through this process on uh, where to place all of those different um, elements. Thank you, David. Are there any more questions regarding the pedestal project seats? This is Jen Truman. I just quick follow up to what Mr. Eatman just said. Um, benches versus these seats. So if there's a site that's highlighted by the policy that has space to put a bench rather than than putting one of these seats, we would put a bench there. Is is that the case? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, uh, certainly, if let's say we had um, a, a instance where we had. Uh, concrete between the back of curb and the sidewalk. Um, we could actually place a, a bench on the back of sidewalk uh, in that particular instance and still meet ADA. Uh, and then, but um, under other situations where we don't have that uh, grass strip filled in, we might not be able to meet ADA with a standard bench. So um, these are, we can set these right against the back of the sidewalk. Um, and still meet the specifications uh, for installation, and uh, they don't take up as much space, and um, we can still have that free clearance as required by ADA. Um, you know, we're not we're, we're not trying to be overly cautious, but we are trying to be cautious with ADA because we don't want to infringe upon that clear space uh, for wheelchairs and uh, for other uh, ADA needs. So. Um, 
uh, it, it is a balance. Absolutely. I just, I think, uh, you know, we can get into the policy, but I think it, it's important that a bench be used when a bench can be used. So I think there are some really obvious benefits for um, families, for larger people, for, you know, someone who might need to lay down. I, I think that there are, there are reasons that it should be a bench as the first choice and these as the second choice, but I'm glad that we have these for an option to add um, seating ability where a bench doesn't work. Understood. Thank you. To add to her question, and I know that we're still, this is a pilot. So maybe one of the things that we can also look into is other design, because as I look at this, I don't have positive feelings about this design personally. They look like prison seats. And I think that there may be a way for there to be a bench on top of a stationary piece, like in the middle, but the top being more bench like that way there's more people that can sit versus just two people. And it accommodates like a straight, uh, uh, maybe a heavier weight than there being two separate ends of it that the weight is placed on. Does that does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes, we'll be glad to look and see. Uh, we haven't been real successful at finding things that would be able to be mounted to concrete with that design. Uh, we can certainly find ground mounted benches, but once we get behind the actual concrete, we find that we're out of right of way because normally that back of concrete is the right of way line. So um, if we were actually to go into the grass, uh, then we're talking about encroachment agreements or actually buying easements. Right, so, but I'm not talking know. about that. I'm talking about like a backless bench that looks more like a T design. You see what I'm saying? Where it's a bench space out, but it has that one singular piece so that it's like this, but there's a piece in the middle. We'll be happy to look for that and uh, we'll be able to report back next month. Okay, thank you. Are there any, uh, I didn't know if there was another slide to this, or this is the last slide on one. Yeah, if we could go to the next slide, um, add some proposals for the policy um, for consideration. And as a reminder, this was an information item. Um, since there's no no time pressure on many in the policy, as, as we said, welcome to adopt, um, refer to committee, um, or to a future meeting. Um, and in your packet, um, there's a memo um, with um, on, on the third page for this item, it puts the, this policy language um, into the context of uh, the full amenity policy, um, if you wanna look at it uh, in that way. Um, and so the first uh, clause there, so an appropriate seating option may be provided at bus stops with at least three to nine boardings a day um so that that's our suggestion um for the boardings range um and i can get into some numbers um after this slide um so this really establishes um a policy for our, our moderate use stops um and as uh as was pointed out earlier um instead of the pedestal seat term um in this case use an appropriate seating option um so that so we've we've built in um, that flexibility in the future to look into um, other styles and provide a, a, a more full size bench uh, when appropriate. Um, and the second clause um, is uh, so a pedestal seat or similar op option may be installed temporarily at sites submitted for shelter development um, until the construction is complete. Um, so so this is our temporary use um, clause um, to more rapidly being able to, to meet needs um, where we do have a little bit higher ridership. Um, and just to note at these sites is where we will have to be, um, we'll have to be placed um, within, fully within right away. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, just just a reminder for, for like the long-term use, which was really that, that first clause that I pointed out. Um, we're aiming for a city right of way with um, existing sidewalk greater than um, five foot. And as we said before, you know, we can install these uh, behind the sidewalk. It's just a two by two footing. Um, but really in cases where um, there's adequate right of way. Um, and if we did wanna look into NCD, NCDOT right of way, um, that would be a similar process to our shelters um, requiring an encroachment agreement um and some of the design requirements that ncdot would have for that would would still be uh, 
still has to be determined. Um, but we do have a site um, on Raleigh Boulevard near uh, Meadow Creek Commons um, that we're taking through the full process with NCDOT where one of these uh, seats is proposed. So that's kind of our, our guinea pig site. So we'll find out more with the coordination with NCDOT on that. Um, and just one last point is the pedestal seat. Uh, you know, the presence of a even a bench or a pedestal seat uh, doesn't ever exclude a bus stop from the shelter program. Next slide. Um, and just to repeat what we said for um, temporary use is should be within city right of way, existing sidewalk width of five feet or greater. Next slide. And um, so this gets into the numbers. Um, so for the three to nine um, range within city right of way, that's 109 uh, bus stops. And um, also just looking at the larger data set, you can you can see that the three and above boardings kind of formed a natural threshold. Um, and so that's why we went with that three to nine number. And um, and just for my last caveat uh, with this is that, um, so these bus stops are the ones that are within city right of way and are on sidewalk, but the actual sidewalk width um, would still need to be determined. Um, but so 109 would be our, our highest number that's eligible by the policy as it's written. Um, but that's all I have. Um, open to any questions and discussion about about the policy. Thank you. Are there any questions regarding the pedestal project? This is Jen Truman. I have a question slash comment. Um, I think that um, I really appreciate having a total number of stops at. I think that one thing that would be really valuable um, would be to have an idea of how much money we have to put towards this and how quickly we would be able to outfit stops. Like, I know we have five right now, right? So is it in six months that we'll have five more or 30 more? Um, some of that scale would be um, helpful to us as we talk about this out in the community. Um, and secondly, I think um, if it might be some time before we have funding, to actually put all these stops out, it would be interesting to pursue um, an option for people to um, donate or purchase one of the seats from the city to put out um, and sort of have adopt a, adopt a seat that uh, local nonprofits or businesses could support in, in front of where they are. If we have a good map of where these could go ahead and pop in and say, all you got to do is give us this amount of money and we can make it happen. Um, so anyways, that's, that's kind of a, like I said, a question and a comment. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We can return um, at a future meeting and talk about, about the funding. And uh, I do like the idea about, about donation or partnerships, uh, just like for us, that this is a lower cost implementation. It does make it more approachable for, for uh, local groups as well. Madam Chair, this is Nathan Spencer. Um, uh, my, I really just have a comment in terms of those proposed um, clauses or uh, motions. Um, I I would recommend that we hold off until we get an understanding of how um, riders feel about these um, and and start to evaluate. Because um, honestly, I I don't think that um, any of us or any staff is used to. Um, uh, coming from, you know, a second job at, uh, you know, seven, eight o'clock at night to sit out on, on a bench with groceries waiting for a bus uh, uh, currently. So if we're, um, if we're not experiencing it in the same setting that people uh, actually are, then uh, we won't be able to make a great evaluation of it. And I'd like to hear what they really think about it before we decide to expand this program or, you know, purchase more or, you know, whatever that looks like. Yeah, that was actually going to be my question as well. If there was any uh, rider input and feedback into the, into the seats. So, 
So we did receive a small amount of feedback from the one that was at Levister Court, and that yielded some of the design changes that Jericho Palm produced for us, um, which to help dissipate the heat and to help with the water draining. But that it was just a small amount of feedback. Yeah, and so uh, Matthew had laid out a uh, a public participation process earlier in the presentation, and so that's kind of uh, where we are. So that's why you may want to wait until we get data back until we, uh, you know, set policy. Um, but policy may or may not affect numbers as far as where you put a facility, but it could impact what type of facility we ultimately put out. So um, you can attack that in a couple of different ways. That's certainly up to the board. This is Jen Truman. Uh, I appreciate that sentiment from um, Nathan and Tulu Pay, um, but I do think that. Um, we need the public input about the seeds specifically, but I think we need to keep this moving forward in terms of identifying sites that where we can potentially put a bench or these seeds um, in the future while we take on that public input so that when we do have a, a comfort level with the public input, we can say this seat, these sites, let's move. We've got the money and do it because I think you know people have been standing for a long time um, and it's not always comfortable. So I think we can move as swiftly as we should by paralleling these efforts. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't, and I don't think Nathan was saying, let's not move forward with that part. I think we were talking about actually implementing, putting the seats in. Um, this is Nathan. I, I absolutely agree with you, Jim. Uh, yeah, uh, identifying and making sure we collect the money and being ready to jump when when we've got solid understanding makes perfect sense. Um, and it looks like we have a comment saying to please think about the winner as well, because no one wants to sit on a cold metal bench. Um, are there any other comments or questions around the pedestal uh, pilot? All right, so we'll go ahead and move on to financial report updates. All right, so I'll wait for that uh, to come up. Uh, so we had talked um, at prior meetings uh, about our financial reports and, and kind of running through that process. Um, so I'm going to go through this kind of quickly today. Uh, but what this is uh, intended to do is really um, to probably spur questions, more questions and thought process than it is to completely provide a 100% overview. Uh, so today I'm going to lay out our financial reports and, and how to view those. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be questions uh, as we go through this, and I'm sure that there'll be questions after we get through with this. Uh, so that's why I'm kind of proposing that we go through this the first time today. Certainly I'll answer any questions you have, but think about them. Look at your reports and your uh, in your monthly agenda package in your financial sections uh, in the, you know, over the next month. And then next month, I'll be happy to come back and answer any detailed questions. And certainly, um, if you send me an email, um, I can answer that as well as uh, kind of gauge what type of information or what type of additional data might be good um, as we approach November. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, when you look at our monthly financials uh, within the Transit Authority report, um, this is the list of, uh, of reports that are currently um, within the agenda package. Um, and so we'll kind of go through each one of these quickly and I'll give an explanation of what they are. Next slide. Um, so this particular uh, slide is the beginning and uh, this does provide some of our dashboard metrics um, as it relates to um, our services. Let me, I'm trying to get rid of the chat here because everything is really small. Okay, that's better. Um, but as you look at uh, this information, it provides information on passengers per hour. And we think of everything um, really in three forms as far as our fixed route services go. Um, we think of everything that's 100% funded by the city of Raleigh. So those are uh, services uh, that aren't subsidized in any way by Wake Transit or any other entity such as uh, Wake Tech or Go Triangle or anything else that we contract. 
Um, so that's 100% city of Raleigh. And traditionally, those are our true urban corridor routes um, that uh, that make up that uh, that particular category. Uh, then we have our Go Raleigh subsidized route. Uh, so those are funded in some way uh, by uh, another entity, uh, at least partially. Um, and obviously the biggest one of those is under Wake Transit, uh, where Wake Transit actually under many circumstances uh, in our network may take an existing route and lower the headway from 30 minutes to 15 minutes. So it adds a lot of additional service to that route. So while we provide the base level of service, Wake Transit's providing that extra money to make sure that we can run that bus by every stop every 15 minutes. So that's what we call a subsidized route. And then we have our 100% contracted route. So those are routes that are just completely funded by another agency, and we operate those routes on their behalf. Uh, that would be uh, the, um, such as uh, Wake Forest, uh, the Wake Forest Loop, uh, the Wake Tech Express, um, as well as uh, Go Triangle Express routes to the east serving Zebulon, Wendell, and Nightdale. Uh, next, um, I'm sorry, let me back up real quick. So under all three of those categories, we really have you know four things that we look at internally, um, especially before we went to suspended fares. Uh, passengers per hour, which is still very important under all scenarios. Uh, Pre-COVID, we, we use passengers per hour to determine passenger loads and figure out if we have uh, overcapacity conditions on certain routes at certain times, things of that nature. Uh, we have our revenue recovery percentage, uh, which those are pretty easy calculations at the moment um, because we're not charging fares. So our revenue cut recovery is, uh, is, is zero um, pretty much uh, passengers per mile. Uh, so th the good thing about a passenger per mile is it's not a variable. A mile is a mile. Um, you can travel a mile at different speeds, but a mile is a mile. Um, when you're looking at passengers per hour, every route has a different average speed per hour. So one route might travel 12 miles in an hour and another route might only cover nine miles in an hour because of heavy traffic. So it really depends on the type of route. So your, your passengers per hour can actually be variable based on your average speed by route. But a passenger mile is a passenger mile and it's pretty equal across all categories. And then ridership, um, uh, change from prior year. So that really shows us, you know, how is the route performing as compared to last year? Under this scenario, we're actually comparing ourselves to last year when we were even in worse COVID conditions. Uh, so that's why you're seeing those growth numbers. Next slide. Okay, this is our balance sheet. And out of all the sheets, this is the most difficult one for me because this talks about all of our assets. This um, A balance sheet really looks at uh, all of your fixed assets and depreciation. Uh, so this is thinking about all of our facilities and all of our buses. And uh, so what's our kind of like, what's our net worth um, minus depreciation? Um, uh, this one uh, really, again, is a uh, national transit database and uh, general accounting type of ledger. Um, it's not extremely useful in the day to day operations of uh, of what we think about as route planning and and finance and policy and things of that nature. Uh, but it does obviously show what our net assets are uh, minus depreciation. Next slide. Then we start getting to the very um, interesting slide or interesting um, uh, ones, uh, which are income statements. And so income statements are really um, broken into a couple of different categories. And for some reason, I am not able to see that. But um, if you look at, let me see here. Andrew, can you go to the next slide for me? All right, go back for me. I've got a pop up coming up right over all of my titles, so I'm going to have to do this by memory for some reason on my screen here. OK, it looks like. Uh, well, it went away, then it came back. Andrea, move your cursor around. There you go. So we uh, if you look at the first column, we have our current month. 
And uh, so that basically shows all of our revenue on a, in, a, in a normal environment and even shows, you know, our revenue right now that we're receiving. Uh, and then uh, obviously our second box below that below that is our expenditures, and those are our cost centers that we actually follow at a go Raleigh level. So salaries and wages, fringe benefits, uh, and you can see everything from taxes, other, um, and, and so all of our categories. Um, so when you look at current month, uh, you're looking. Let me say you've got current month and then actual year to date and budget year to date. So current month is going to be. Um, what the actuals were for, for that particular month that we're talking about. And under this scenario, I think that is August. Um, we're going to have, you know, your actuals year to date. So that's actually going to be from July 1. So if you're in um, August, that's going to contain July and August because it's year to date. It's going to from July 1. And then your budget year to date. So if you take, so what, if you take your overall budget for that line item, and divide it by two twelfths. So, you know, basically two of the months out of the 12, um, then that's going to be what that number is. Um, it's going to give you a year to date variance for our budgeted revenue as well as our budgeted expenditures. Um, and then, uh, then the, you have your final column there. Uh, which actually provides a percentage of your annual budget. Andrew, if you could move your cursor around a little bit and go to the next slide. All right, so the uh, the next one is actually our um, operating statistics. And again, it follows generally uh, the same format uh, as the last one. It just uh, does that in a different way. And this is woefully small, y'all. But uh, it is in your reports there. Uh, so again, everything is broken out by current period, uh, year to date, a percent change. So certainly, again, as you review these, if you have any questions, let us know. Um, the beautiful thing about this report, um, back when we were actually charging fares, is this is how we tracked fares by category. So this provide, provided us with a wealth of data on, you know, how many seniors were we transporting? How many students were we transporting? Um, what types of fare types uh, were happening? Um, what types of regional trips were we accepting onto our system? Uh, so uh, certainly uh, we have suspended fares currently and we'll be in discussions about FY23 um, in the near future. Uh, but again, this is how that normally would work. But the fair categories is the greatest element that was within the operating statistics. Next slide. Uh, this actually breaks it down to um, uh, total passengers. So this provides it by total passenger for all of the three categories um, that we talked about earlier. Um, so base, you know, our base routes or pre-expansion or just city of Raleigh. Um, uh, we have our, uh, our funded routes and then, um, our, uh, contracted routes there. I'm sorry, our, our, I think those are the wake tech routes at the bottom. Or not wake tech, wake transit, my apologies. Uh, again, it's going to provide you with a comparison of ridership for current month to prior month, um, as well as prior year. And again, uh, that prior year just helps us think about how we are uh, dealing um, from year to year of with ridership. Uh, if you look at trends in ridership, months from year to year have the same trends. October and November are traditionally our largest ridership months of the year. Um, and that happens every single year. And so if you were looking at those graphs over many years. Uh, so ridership does actually have very predictable ebbs and flows from month to month, year to year. Obviously, every year is up and down, but those ebbs and flows within the year remain the same very much so. Next slide. Uh, this uh, actually gets into our uh, route uh, statistics um, stats here. Um, that's just a, a continuation from uh, from the first slide. Again, looking at new routes from expansion and then contract routes. 
Uh, so this is just a little bit blown up because it was at the bottom of the first uh, slide. Uh, but this is just a continuation of the uh, of, of the last slide. Next slide. Um, so what, now we have uh, ridership. Uh, Andrew, can you move your cursor a little bit? Yeah, ridership percentage by time period. Um, so uh, again, I'm sure that everyone wonders how much ridership do we actually carry at five o'clock in the morning or how much are we carrying at 10 or 11 o'clock at night? It doesn't mean that those times are important uh, because every time traditionally, every time you make your service last an hour longer, the hour and the hour before that grows because people have a second and third chance to get home in case they miss it or they have to work late. So while you while we don't show a lot of ridership at 12, without that 12 o'clock trip or in that 12 o'clock slot, the 10 o'clock ridership would be really low. So it's really important for us to provide that extended service because as you go backwards, your ridership increases again because people are thinking about, I can't wait until that very last bus and especially for the type of, you know, if somebody's dealing with employment, um, because that becomes very, you know, very difficult. Uh, so they always want a, a trip or two or three buffer between the end and when they actually need to take the trip. Uh, so again, while those four o'clock trips and midnight trips aren't exactly the most productive, they're super important for that overall trip there, you know, those trips that occurred just after and just before. Next slide. And um, so this is uh, just our variance analysis. Um, when you we were looking at the budget earlier, if we had major variances, um, Lena Hopper is our finance director over at Go Raleigh. Uh, she provides within your report, it's in your uh, agenda today, an actual verbal description of, uh, of those variances. And I believe we use five per, no, we use any percent um, as a variance that's, uh, I think it's over 3% or so. Um, but anyway, any type of uh, variance that needs to be noted is within that report. And it uh, breaks it down by cost center. Next slide. Um, we do uh, still um, you know, track all of our COVID um, costs. Uh, and these are direct COVID costs, so that's within your report. Um, this isn't all of our COVID costs, but this is our um, our direct COVID cost as it relates to supplies and materials. Next slide. And again, this is the uh, variance analysis uh, for, for the current month, which would be August in this case, and then our year to date, which is gonna show where we are year to date in this particular scenario. Um, under, this, under this scenario, um, we are uh, currently uh, um, as you see it, the net subsidy at the bottom. Um, so our variance there on a year to date basis is showing over budget. And so uh, we do have, uh, a, you know, 473,000 over. Um, many times if there's an extra payroll within a pay period, because when we project out for a uh, year to date, um, we carry generally carry two payrolls per month. Uh, so sometimes that can throw that off uh, as well as other other items. Generally speaking, though, when we have uh, variances in those ranges uh, by the end of the year, they all flush out because all that takes is a couple of insurance payments for us when we front load insurance. And that pretty much um, puts us in a deficit until that levels out over the year. So, again, when you see those deficits, look at your variance reports because most of the time you'll be able to tell, oh, that's an expense that's gonna expense out over the next nine months. Next slide. And we do have, um, and move your cursor there, Andrea. Maybe you can't. So yeah, I've got that pop up again. Uh, again, this is um, showing uh, each month uh, with the expenses by cost center again. Next slide. And then finally, this is our inventory analysis. Um, we do carry uh, our own small uh, mini warehouse, <laughs> pretty much at our uh, operations and maintenance facility. 
in, in our maintenance facility at our operations facility on Pole Road. Uh, so this actually shows our ending inventory uh, for each month, each month for July and August uh, for the period. Um, we do carry obviously parts um, and we carry our fluids uh, for our vehicles as well. Uh, remember, we do have uh, over 100 you know, vehicles and rolling stock. Uh, that's our actual revenue vehicles, um, as well as we have all of our support vehicles as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so we just added this report. This is fuel consumption. Um, so when you think about fuel, uh, our two big fuel types are CNG and, uh, and diesel, obviously. Um, but when you start looking at our cost as a percentage, um, it's pretty amazing. Um, our uh, you know, fuel consumption for uh, diesel, I think, uh, and CNG, uh, you can see the how the cost variance is so different there. Uh, diesel only represents about 55% of our utilization. So about 55% of our total fuel is diesel, um, but diesel represents, um, you know, uh, a much greater, what is that? That's actually uh, 30, 35, I believe that is, or I'm sorry, is that, that is about 55. Yeah, so about 55% as utilization, but it represents uh, over 80% of our cost. So um, we're getting a lot of value on the CNG currently. Um, we will be adding electric into this as now, as you're aware, we have uh, uh, put electric vehicles on the road. Um, so we'll be putting, we'll figure out how to put our equivalent um, electric usage against uh, diesel as well as CNG. Uh, in some future reports. Next slide, I'm almost at the end. And normally we have a go pass, which is our uh, contracted passes for uh, uh, prepaid or front paid uh, services uh, through many of our larger employers, as well as we provided a uh, summary of our line ridership when it was operating um, in pre COVID. And I think that's about it. Next slide. Yep, question and discussion. Again, huge amount of information. Just wanted to basically give an overview of uh, what's in your reports. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask those now. Or if you come up with any, um, please email me and we'll be able to go into a, a deep dive. I will have to admit that if we need to go into a deep dive, I'm going to ask Siobhan to do it. Um, that's about uh, probably as, uh, as good as I get. Um, but uh, she uh, works on these along with Lena uh, a great deal every month uh, as we report these out to, you know, to federal agencies and local agencies. So thank you. Thank you for that extremely thorough explanation of our financial reports. <laughs> that gives us a basis to go off of, especially as we're waiting uh, to do our orientation, because that would have been something I guess we kind of would have gone over there uh, to acclimate everybody. Are right, we going to move on? To, do we have any questions? Madam Chair, I'm going to use this transition actually to, to step out because I, I do have to uh, go to another um, meeting, but I did want to uh, we put that staff can cover the staffing uh, position for, that we discussed at uh, route as they uh, uh, they just spoke about it rather than uh, had anything prepared. So, okay. thank right. you so much. And I, thank you, thank you for joining us. I know that Joshua also had to step uh, off while we were in the middle of that presentation. All right, we're going to jump right into the accident reporting. I, I was on mute, so my apologies. I uh, was talking to myself. Uh, so I was saying that uh, Mr. Bryant uh, did have to step away. I got a message uh, just a bit ago. Um, so I can go into that item, at least as an introduction. Um, but uh, we can certainly bring that back into committee or bring it back to the full board in November. 
So however you would like for me to proceed, I'll be happy to. Let's do uh, bring it to committee and then the full, full board. Let the committee decide. So okay. Full board next next month. Uh, would you like to take that to uh, to policy, uh, finance and policy? Or are you uh, certainly up to discretion of the chair of the board? For the accident report? Yes. Yeah. I think we should move it to route. Okay. Um, all right, so then the next item are committee reports. Uh, Nathan just had to step off the call. Um, there's performance reports, but let's go ahead and just jump into the regional staffing piece because we, at this point, it's just the three of us and I don't want us to have too much information out there that the rest of the board doesn't get a chance to be privy to. And I know the marketing committee did not meet this month. Um, so it's just the route committee and then the finance and policy, I actually would suggest that we hold both of those until our next meeting. Unless there's some information in that regional staffing meeting update that we need to hear just as, as the three of us. No, I, this is David Walker, uh, Transit Division, and I, I provided just a verbal update during the route committee meeting uh, regarding the last uh, regional meeting that was held by the, the, the local transit partners. Um, you know, at, at the end of the call, basically, you know, it, in, in the in comparison, Go Raleigh is actually doing fairly well with their staffing uh, compared to Go Triangle. Uh, Go Triangle stated that they were down 40 operators. Um, Chapel Hill is down 36 full time operators and 15 of their part time operators. Go Durham is down. They didn't provide a number, but they gave us a percentage of 25 percent. Um, uh, down on their staffing. Uh, Go Raleigh is down between 15 and 20 uh, operators, uh, and we we still continue to be the only agency in the in the region, uh, the only major agency in the region that hasn't had to have any service cuts. So we're we're holding our own for now, uh, and uh, continuing to collaborate with our regional partners to you know see if there's. Um, ways that we can work together to you know advertise and have you know hiring um events together as you know to where we might pull in additional uh, interested uh applicant applicants all right thank you for that update i'm muted okay i'm not good all right thank you for that um i do just have a question have we received any as far as the finance and policy have we received any uh Submissions for the RFP. So I'll go ahead and just provide a quick little update on that, if that's okay with the board. Yeah, that works I mean, for me. All right. So uh, we did um, uh, solicit uh, for proposals. Um, we went through uh, everything. Well, obviously, we had it on the street for about three weeks. We went through a pre-proposal meeting um, during our pre-proposal we had five firms uh, that showed or at least uh, came to uh, that particular meeting uh, mr walker you can correct me it was either four or five um, uh, from there uh, they had another two weeks to place their proposals um, and at the end of the process we ended up with one proposal uh, so we cannot move forward with a single proposal uh, since that time, staff has reached out to um, uh, to uh, really all of the vendors that have shown some interest uh, within our contract, um, and they all expressed uh, some concern with our management fee structure. Um, there are a couple of things within our management fee structure that do provide some level of risk uh, to those firms. Um, everything from... Uh, initial capital outlay to pension plans and things of that nature. Uh, so right now staff is uh, finalizing its review of the pro existing proposal um, and potential proposal types with all of our interested vendors. Um, and we will uh, we're charting a course for uh, re releasing this as quickly as possible. Um, this will obviously take us beyond um, our existing um uh contract which uh, would expire uh december 30 uh, but we do have the option to 
uh, extend service with our existing contractor in 60 day increments. So that would be in two month increments. Um, do not have to exercise all of those at once. We can exercise those in two month increments um, until we are able to secure uh, a permanent contract with a vendor. Uh, so that is the path that we're on. Uh, one thing's for sure, we need to make sure that we get multiple proposers uh, and, and pricing um, with our next try. Um, certainly the, the, the most, put it this way, the most popular and proposed upon method of contracting is a service fee contract. Uh, right now we're a management fee contract where the contractor has a set fixed overhead fee um, so that's fixed on a monthly basis and then all costs pass through to the city. So in this case for us, uh, currently, um, uh, we, you know, that, you know, about a $35 million contract, about $450,000 of that, uh, is actually paid directly to the vendor, which pays for overhead attorney's fees, two positions, um, payroll accounts payable, accounts receivable. So all of those functions are within that 450,000. And so, and then the rest of that 35 million is a direct pass through to the city of Raleigh. So we, we pay everything. And so that's really a partnership because we have to figure out how to spend that 34, $34.5 million to the best of our ability. Um, the favored contract is a service fee contract where someone comes in and says, we'll pay you $85 an hour or service hour to operate your system. Under that scenario, they have a set contract and what's in the contracts, what they do. And they charge you $85 an hour to run the service. So under that scenario, there's not a lot of partnership because they follow contract and charge $85 an hour. Um, so I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I would say that majority of systems in the United States run under that model, especially large systems. So uh, we're looking at, you know, what does that mean? How does that impact our existing financial systems, um, especially the way we allocate federal funding against our operating costs uh, within the system currently? Uh, so that has lots of implications. We uh, currently leverage up to six million annual of federal funds into our system. And so we don't know exactly how that impacts that six million. Um, so we, we've got a lot of work to do and we've already begun. Um, but we don't know exactly where we're headed yet. We're going to be coming back with information to the board. Um, we may uh, hopefully put out some teaser information of what our plans are uh, in advance of the November meeting. Uh, but the, the reality is, is we need to hit the ground running just as quick as we can, but we need to do that in a very uh, deliberate and well-informed way. Um, and we're working towards that goal. So I know that that was a whirlwind tour of uh, where we are and where we're going, uh, but I did think it was important to lay that out. No, I thank you for that update, and I'm, I apologize that you are going to have to redo it again. But maybe next month we'll have some, some you know better, uh, something better to report out to the authority. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, like I said, there was no um, meeting in this month for the marketing committee, so we're going to skip that update. Is there anything else that we need to discuss today? This is LaPonda. I have a, a question just back to what we were just talking about with the RFP. Um, so at, during the re-release of the RFP, what will be different, I guess, this time around than what was done the first time? Okay, so we ha really have uh, two different paths. One is to try to maintain a management fee contract and remove risk. Um, that would require us to uh, reorganize uh, the pension under a different structure, um, uh, not changing the pension in any way, but it would have to be reorganized where it would be safeguarded uh, and not be and the a company that took on that asset would not be liable for it, uh, as well as uh, we would have to look at some of uh, we did le release our last RFP as a reimbursement um rfp or 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 management fee um contract um that means that someone needs about five million 
um, in assets or capital in order to start the system because they could acquire, they could actually incur up to five million expenses before they get repaid. Um, so that's like borrowing five million and accumulating interest on that over a five year contract um, and then building that cost into that contract. Um, some vendors like that, some don't. Under this scenario, it appears we only had one vendor that that liked it. <laughs> so, so you know, we're we're looking at options for how we might be able to restructure that five million in capital requirement uh, within the contract as well. The, the the other completely different step is to release a service fee contract, or what most people call in the industry of an operating and maintenance contract. Under that scenario, we would uh, definitely get three to five bidders. Um, but it would be a service fee contract and we would not and it would not be the traditional um, what I would call partnership structure that you have under a management fee. It would be a true contract with a set rate. Uh, so again, uh, that's that, that those are pretty straightforward. Um, you develop a very tight contract on exactly what the expectations are um, and then they perform that service on a set rate per hour. Um, now, when it comes to uh, collective bargaining and all of the other uh, types of activities that might occur or initiatives, um, if you want additional initiatives done, you have to renegotiate that contract. Um, and generally, uh, the, the contractors do um, perform collective bargaining and other activities within their service fee as long as that's uh, outlined within the contract. But that's the that's the reason for the contract. Again, there's not a lot of of uh, it's not as much partnership there, um, but there is a lot more guarantee for, you know, it's hard to say whether, you know, what exactly that is. You're probably looking at, you know, a five to 7% increase in cost, uh, potentially. That's, I would say potentially. But the thing is, is that you also know what your fixed rates are because that's a fixed rate that they're going to give you over a five year period. So it's very easy to budget over that five years. We know exactly what our service levels are going to increase by over the next five years. Uh, so it does provide us very stable projections for cost. Um, but again, you lose some of that control that you have under uh, or control partnership that you have under that management fee structure. I hope that helps a little bit. It does. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Do either of those opportunities or shifting the type of contract will either of those alleviate some of the problem we currently have? Not just with changing the management, but with not having this problem in the future, possibly. Um, under that scenario, uh, I mean, they they all employees would be 100% direct employees of the company, um, very much like they are now. Um, except uh, there there would not be, yeah. So under that scenario, uh, everything falls under the rate as quoted within the RFP. Um, so we're really 100% out at that point. We we don't I don't have. You know, unless I define it in the contract, um, uh, you know, I can't really control uh, how often they clean the bus. Like in the in the contract, we're going to tell them how many times they have to clean the vehicle and how they have to clean the vehicle. But if we do something above and beyond that, I have to renegotiate contract. So uh, again, a service fee contract is very, you know, it's much more rigid, and that's just the way you know that that's the way it is there. I understand. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions? And I'm not trying to make it sound scary. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying to make, you know, that there is that those there's trade offs for that. There's good and there's pros and cons for both, uh, obviously. So it just depends. Um, both are used nationally. Um, uh, I would say that currently many more contracts are going to uh, maintenance and operations uh, just because of the environments that we're in now. Uh, but uh, certainly um, management fee contracts are very, you know, very common as well. So. Mr. Bateman, when you present um, and there's more folks present at the next meeting, could you include, um, I know you guys are looking at the financial impacts of the two different models in terms of change, but could you could you include some of this thought about the kind of HR impacts and the things that we would have to maybe be more specific about in a service fee contract? Um, we've talked about them in terms of the RFP, um, but if it would be helpful to have some of those notes when you present in November. Okay. Yeah, especially if it may come down to we're not getting enough bids and might have to pivot. 
So at least we would know how can we cover ourselves if we need to do that to kind of make sure that we remove as much of the risk of us having to go through this that we've been going through or worse because we're completely out of it. Um, that might give us an opportunity if we have to shift to that to put some language in there where there's still a little bit of hands on this. <laughs> Yeah, I understand, but I mean, under that scenario, you got to understand you are you are dealing with a, a flat service fee rate, um, and and certainly they already have a legal CBA with the uh, with the union, so under that scenario, you're much more removed from that process. Um, so, you know, those are those are kind of the realities there that that we have to think about. So. Um, again, I'm not saying that one's right or better than the other. Uh, I'll both have pros, cons, and I'll be glad to lay those out in November. Um, but yeah, we've got to get busy and uh, we'll, we'll certainly have that information in November. That's helpful. I was thinking more in terms of the um, performance reports and reporting points that we would need to include in the contract like we've talked about. Now, um, under service fee, understand your point. Yeah, under a service fee contract, uh, th those performance metrics are super important because that's really what governs the contract. Um, right. As far as liquidated damages, under a management fee structure, you don't traditionally you don't use man you don't use liquidated damages as much because it's really a partnership to make sure that you're meeting all of your metrics. Under that service fee structure, it's the contractor's responsibility to meet the metrics, and then if they have successive failures, then they start entering the world of liquidated damages. And so, yes, those are very important, and we can lay those out most definitely. I didn't take it that way, uh, but you are 100% correct. Thank you. Yeah, I think to Tallulah's, to Tallulah Pay's point, it could potentially give us um, the ability to be more on top of a future contract um, as an RTA to understand how they are or are not meeting those goals that we set. Understood. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that, Jen. Are there any other comments or questions or concerns before we conclude our meeting today? All right, well, I will call this meeting to conclusion. Our uh, October 14th, uh, October RTA meeting to conclusion at 5.34 p.m. I actually dropped my lip gloss on perfect time and it sounded like the gavel. So thank you all. Thank you for your time. Please be safe. Um, and I will see you next month. Uh, at our